It is so good to be back in worship with you after a couple weeks of vacation. For those who are new to our church family or for those who've been here a long time, you're in luck. We have an awesome new sermon series, hence my Christmas hat. We will be exploring for the next six weeks different Dr. Seuss books and seeing what lessons of faith we might be able to draw from them. You might be able to guess because of my hat. Today we are starting with none other than How the Grinch Stole Christmas. So if you love Christmas like I do and want to go grab your favorite Christmas sweater, make hot chocolate, pretend it's not a million degrees outside, you should totally do that. Join me in that. (laughs) But we're excited for, again, this sermon series. It'll be a lot of fun. Next week we will be focusing on the Lorax. And what's cool about that is it is trying to walk with our children who are also doing virtual vacation Bible school that next week to focusing on creation care. So I have an announcement from Miss Madison about that. 
She wanted to share that Creation Care VBS is here. Next week, Grace UMC will be hosting a virtual VBS, and this Sunday, a box full of VBS supplies will be de delivered to your doorstep. It will include all of the physical materials you'll need for the week and information on how to get to the virtual materials. If your family is active at Grace, you are already on the list. If you or someone you know maybe is interested in joining us, please reach out to Miss Madison so she can get, get materials to them. This VBS has been designed to be personal for your family and can be tailored to what works for you. Go at your own pace and join in on the fun. Again, if you have questions, please reach out to Miss Madison. So we're really excited about that. Again, it's not going to be a typical VBS, but we're so excited for the creativity and uh, direction that Miss Madison is taking our Grace kids on. All are welcome, so please reach out if your child wants to join in that fun opportunity. With that, I invite you now to turn for our call to worship led by Deb Helmer. Please join me in our call to worship. With summer in full swing and the heat rising, it might feel a little silly to read a tale about the Christmas season. Let's all gather to hear a message of love. You hardly need a better reason. Even if today your shoes feel too tight or your head doesn't feel screwed on quite right, let's all gather and welcome one another to hear a message of light. Whether this morning you feel the sour grouchiness of the Grinch or the warmth and hope of Cindy Lou, let's all gather to meet God across time and space as church filled with family, friends, and pets too. I now invite you to sing our opening hymn, This is My Father's World, verses 1 and 2 by following the words on the screen or by clicking the link in the comments to sing along with the sheet music online. Would you join me in a spirit of prayer? Dear God, we thank you for the bountiful blessings you have bestowed on us. Guide us in being good stewards of these gifts. Let us care for all of your bountiful creation from the redwood forests to the Gulf Stream waters. Make us instruments of your peace in order to put an end to rockets red glare and bombs bursting in air. Help us to love and care for all of our neighbors locally and globally so that we might be truly crowned with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. In your name, amen. 
I now invite the children to gather around the screen so that they can hear children's message from Miss Madison about how that Grinch's heart grew in the Dr. Seuss book, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Hi Grace Kids, it's Miss Madison. Happy Sunday. I'm so excited to be with you this morning. Today, Pastor Maddie is talking about the Grinch who stole Christmas. And I know what you're thinking, it's July, it's a weird time to talk about the Grinch, right? But there's a couple of things that you probably want to know. Number one, did you know that some people celebrate Christmas in July? It's kind of a halfway point until when Christmas happens again. And so a lot of people, to spread some Christmas cheer, get excited, get dressed up, and have their own Christmas parties in the middle of July. That's actually one of my favorite holidays, is Christmas in July. Another thing that you probably want to know is that Pastor Maddie is starting a sermon series this week all about Dr. Seuss and where we can see God in Dr. Seuss. So today she starts talking about the Grinch who stole Christmas. And I want to tell you I'm outside because I love sitting on my porch and it fills my heart with so much joy to just be able to sit on the porch, listen to the animals, and feel the wind blow. It just makes me a happier person. And one of my favorite parts about the Grinch is when the Grinch's heart grows. And I don't know if you remember this, but the Grinch's heart grows because he does something that he realizes he loves. He helps people. And so I want you guys to think of things that you love. Can you think of some, some things that you love? Now I want you to think, those things, do they make your heart feel bigger? I know that your heart can't necessarily get bigger, right? But there are lots of things in life that can make us feel like our heart has grown. And so what I want you to do, I'm doing this too, I'm doing this right now. I want you to grab some paper and you can cut out a heart. Well, you'll want to cut out multiple hearts. I'm just gonna do one for right now. And if you remember how to cut out a heart, you fold the paper and then you do half a heart. And you can do more than one at a time when you're doing these. So look, I've got a heart and you know, not all hearts look the same and that's okay. So then I want you to think of different things that fill your heart and make you feel more full and like you have a bigger heart. So for one of, the, me, one of mine is sitting on the porch and write that down. And then I want you to do some recycling. Find um, some sort of a container, it doesn't have to be a jar, it could be a cup that maybe you guys don't use to drink out of, or a box or something. And I want you to take your hearts, because I want you to do several, I want you to think of many, many things that make your heart feel bigger. And I want you to drop them into your jars or containers, whatever they are. And then when you feel like maybe your heart might need to grow just a little bit so you can feel a little happier, I want you to grab your container, pull one out, and try to do what it says. And you know, some, sometimes maybe you won't be able to do that exact same thing right in that moment, but that's okay. You could pick another one out or you could make a plan to do that thing. So I want you to try that with me. Um, and. I want you to let me know how it goes. So I hope you'll enjoy this activity. And another thing that I wanted to tell you is that you can keep adding to this. So when you um, 
find something new that makes your heart feel bigger, you can add something else to it. And then maybe you'll get to pull that thing out. So before we go, I want to pray with you. So will you all pray with me? Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for yesterday. And thank you for tomorrow. Help us to follow the Grinch and try to make our hearts grow bigger. We love you, God. Amen. Bye, Grace Kids. Have a good day. Hear these words about Paul's conversion of heart found in the book of Acts. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue of, at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him to the land and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias? He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias. He came in and laid his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and the kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Thanks be to God. Would you all pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be good and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch who lived just north of Whoville did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be perhaps that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. 
Many of us are more than familiar with the classic Dr. Seuss book, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And elephant in the room, yes, I am wearing a Grinch costume. It is built for a six foot tall man, so it fits perfectly. But I know that for me during the Christmas season, it feels an absolute necessity to watch the movie uh, about the grouchy Grinch who decides to steal Christmas from the joyful Who's down in Whoville. So we're gonna do a raise of hands virtually. Raise your hand, who prefers the original animated short from 1966? All right, now who prefers the live version with Jim Carrey as the Grinch? And then finally, who prefers the new adaption that came out in 2018? It's animated. I have to be honest, I completely forgot there was this 2018 version and I haven't seen it, so I can't speak to it. But for me, I'm going to have to say it is a tie between the original and the Jim Carrey version. I remember growing up with the original and I think the fact that it was only 26 minutes long really suited my attention span at the time. But once the newer version was released, I really loved the depth of the movie. You really got to know the characters and their backstories, most notably the Grinch himself. And we got the song, Where Are You Christmas, which is an absolute bop. I'm sure that some of you might agree or disagree with my assessment, so please feel free to comment as you wish about which Grinch movie is your favorite. But as I was reading the Dr. Seuss book, How the Grinch Stole Christmas in preparation for this sermon, the first thing that I realized is that there is very little detail given about the Grinch. All we know is for some reason or another, he really hates Christmas and in turn, everyone who loves Christmas. The book describes him hating four things in particular, the toys, the noise, the feast, and the singing. Which, when we read this as children, we are kind of primed to think that the reason the Grinch hates these things is simply because he hates the joy of Christmas and hates that the Who's are joyful. Which kind of feels pretty petty, to hate for no reason at all. Most of us know that there are always reasons why people are the way they are, whether it be grouchy or joyful, hateful or loving. We all come from stories of people and places and moments that shape and define us. Which is why I was so grateful for the Hollywood version of Dr. Seuss's book because we finally got to see the reason why the Grinch hates Christmas. And it wasn't petty at all. We see that he was bullied for being different from the other Who's. He was green and had hair all over his body and he ate plates instead of the cookies that were on them. It all, uh, all kind of came to a climax when he made a nice gift for his crush. He decided to you know, spruce up his look by shaving off the hair on his face so that he could look like the other boys in his class. And the result proved disastrous and he was humiliated in front of everyone, his crush included. So he threw a tantrum and he stormed off to the mountain where he has lived isolated ever since. Maybe he hated toys because it actually reminded him of the gift he tried to give his crush Martha May years ago. Maybe he hated noise because it reminded him of the laughter of the Who's making fun of him for being different. Maybe he hated feasts because it was another visible reminder of an event he was isolated from. And maybe he hated singing because he didn't feel welcome to sing along. We don't really know the intricacies of his pain, but with this part of his story revealed, we can empathize with the Grinch and see that it's more than the grouchiness of someone who hates Christmas for no reason at all. Similarly, our scripture text comes from the book of Acts, and we hear the familiar story of Saul's journey on the road to Damascus. Now, just like the Grinch, we see a man who appears to, for no reason at all, really hate the disciples of Christ. That's an understatement. He persecutes followers of Jesus on behalf of the Roman Empire. We see in Acts chapter 7, Saul witnessing the first martyr, Stephen, be stoned and then 
later approving of his murder. And then in chapter 8, we see him, quote, ravage the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women and committing them to prison. Now, if we didn't know any better, we could just think that he hated the disciples of Christ for no reason at all. But we know a bit more about Saul's story, and we can find it elsewhere in Scripture. In his letter to the church in Galatia, we discover that Quote, he was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. He advanced in Judaism beyond many among his people of the same age, for Saul was far more zealous for the traditions of his ancestors. From this letter, we can see that Saul is a Jew, just like the fellow disciples of Christ he is persecuting, just like Jesus himself. And he claims that he is a righteous Jew, following the Jewish law and its oral traditions of his ancestors of faith. I wonder if maybe some of the reason he hated the disciples so much was because he genuinely thought, like the Pharisees, that these disciples were a real threat to the Jewish tradition. Or maybe he truly thought he was being faithful to Judaism and in turn to God. But beyond his piety, we see that not only is Saul a Jew, a minority in first century Palestine, he is also a Roman citizen. Theologian Howard Thurman writes, but unlike Jews for the most part, Saul was a free Jew. He was a citizen of Rome. A desert and a sea were placed between his status in the empire and that of his fellow Jews. He was a minority with majority privileges. I wonder if another reason why Saul hated the followers of Christ so much was because he was scared that he might meet their same fate. Maybe he was frightened to deviate from the Roman Empire to only be murdered like Jesus and like Stephen, and so instead of standing with his Jewish siblings of faith, he chose to protect himself by persecuting them. We don't really know the intricacies of his fear and in turn conviction, but with this part of his story revealed, we can empathize with Saul and see that it's more than him simply hating and persecuting the Jews. Both Saul and the Grinch reveal the truth that so many of us know, which is we don't really know the depths of people's stories. We don't really know why people may act grouchy or hateful. But we do know that more often than not, there is a very human, very relatable, very raw reason underlying why people are the way they are. But we know that for both the Grinch and Saul, this isn't the end of either of their stories. For Saul, we see that on the road to Damascus, He's breathing threats and murder against the disciples and is on his way to arrest any followers of Christ and bring them back to the holy city. And then all of a sudden, a light from heaven flashes around him and the voice of the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I am Jesus. Saul is sent by the divine voice to Damascus, but as he stands up from the ground, he can see nothing but darkness. He was without sight for three days until a disciple of Christ, a fellow Jew, a fellow brother in faith, lays his hands on him, and Saul is healed of the darkness and can see the light once again. This is Saul's conversion moment. You know, before he was living into his hatred and operating out of fear, and now he is reconciled to his siblings in faith, and he is healed of his thoughts and actions and current reality of darkness. Saul is healed. Saul is converted. Saul is redeemed. Similarly, we see in Dr. Seuss's story that the Grinch decides to take all of the toys and stockings and Christmas trees and roast beast on Christmas Eve so that the Who's might feel as hurt and as alone and as different as he does. But much to his surprise, that Christmas morning he hears the sound of singing echoing up the mountain. 
He couldn't steal Christmas nor the Who's joy after all. It is in this moment that the Grinch says, maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light, and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast, and he, he himself, the Grinch carved the roast beast. This is the Grinch's conversion moment. You know, before he was living into his wounds of rejection and isolation and operating with hate, and now he is reconciled to his siblings down in Whoville, and he is healed of his pain of being different and joins in their song together. The Grinch is healed, the Grinch is converted, the Grinch is redeemed. The ending of these two stories reveal a truth to us that many of us know full well, that people can change. Maybe it's through a divine vision or the voice of a little girl named Cindy Lou. Maybe it's through the healing touch of an enemy or a song of joy echoing on the mountain. We all have had and will continue to have big and little moments of conversion. The Grinch and Saul remind us that we all have a past, a story, a reason why people are the way they are. May we have empathy and grace for ourselves and our neighbors as we navigate fear, anger, hurt, and even hatred. And the Grinch and Saul also remind us that people can change. May we live into this simple truth, knowing that our God shows up in a million different ways, helping, nudging, prompting our hearts to grow in love of God and love of neighbor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me for our collective prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. I invite you in the next few minutes to enter this time of offering. You will see some joys and concerns from our church family for us to be in prayer for. If you have other prayers to share, please add them to the comments on either Facebook or YouTube or reach out to us during office hours. You will also see a screen with instructions on how you can continue giving financially to our church, either by mail, online, or through text. Because of your incredible generosity, you are still faithfully living into our mission of welcoming all to grow in grace together, even in this time of social distancing. If you are new to worship here at Grace, we invite you to share prayers and financially as you are comfortable. Your presence is gift enough, even and especially online. And if you are interested in learning more about becoming a part of our church, please reach out to us through Facebook or by calling the office. Our community would be thrilled to welcome you into our church family. Now let's go to God in this time of offering.
please join me in a responsive prayer of the people. Holy God, we come to you with many places, moments, and people who are in our hearts for reasons of joy and celebration and reasons of worry and grief. In this next moment of silence, we lift up those people and places to you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God of healing, we pray for the medical workers, doctors, nurses, medical staff, and volunteers, both locally and globally, who are continuing to confront the pandemic in their daily lives and care for those with COVID-19. Though we may feel fatigued with this virus, we ask that you strengthen these workers and sustain them in their ministry of healing. We lift up those who are currently suffering from the virus, those who are recovering from it, and those who have joined you in your heavenly kingdom after fighting it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God of newness, we give you thanks for another year of ministry together as seen in the United Methodist calendar year. Give us clarity as we live out our mission together. Grant us peace as we make tough decisions as a community and support one another in our journeys of faith. For all those pastors and churches in our conference and world who are in transition with new leadership, we ask that you give them grace in this process and joy in the newness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Gracious God, we lift up all those in education who are discerning next steps for the fall. As decisions are made and information is delivered, we ask that grace be bountiful, knowing that no one will be fully satisfied. May these decisions be marked by care for our youth and children, especially the most vulnerable. Give strength to our our educators as they adapt to whatever changes lie ahead, and may your creativity overwhelm them in the coming weeks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We, We pray for all of this and so much more in the words that your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Hear these words of benediction. May we go forth this week leaning into the simple truth that we all have our own stories and we are all able to change. May God bless us as we extend grace to one another and remain open to moments of conversion all around us. Amen. Stay safe and see y'all online next week. Thank you.